Did you know that one in seven Christians around the world face high levels of persecution and discrimination for their faith? That's equivalent to 365 million people being harassed, threatened, shunned, attacked, mistreated, because they believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Savior, the light of the world. These people live in areas where faith costs a lot. They see firsthand how hard darkness tries to fight against the light. And here at Open Doors, we release the annual World Watch List, which shows the top 50 most dangerous countries for Christians to live in. But this list is not a lost battle. It shows that the church is alive, it is active, and it is growing. God is moving. People are coming to Christ, praying for their nations and for each other. The World Watch List shows that the church can continue to thrive despite persecution, that even in the darkest places, God's voice cannot be silenced. This is the release of the 2024 World Watch List. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our special event, the release of the 2024 World Watch List. My name is Jared. This is Nicolette. We are so glad that you have joined us for this special presentation, and we hope that throughout the event, you're encouraged by how God is moving and how the church is growing and thriving despite persecution in the world. Yes, indeed. Here at Open Doors Canada, we work to strengthen Christians where faith costs the most. Mm -hmm. We do this through a global underground network. And basically what that means is that we ask Christians what we can do to support them, meet them where they are, so that they can continue to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to be the church growing and thriving despite the pressure that they face for their faith. Yeah. And, you know, a really important tool for our work is the World Watch List. This list is a ranking of the top 50 most dangerous countries to live in as a Christian. It is the most authoritative document of its kind, and it helps us to direct our work and our prayers. Yes. Now you can download your own digital copy of the World Watch List at opendoorscanada.org slash worldwatchlist, all one word, opendoorscanada.org slash worldwatchlist. We encourage you to do that right now so that you can have a copy in front of you during our event. In the World Watch List, you'll find a description of what persecution looks like in each of the top 50 countries in 2024, and you'll learn how you can be praying for your global church family. Yeah. So before we begin to reveal the top 50 list here, we would like to give you some insight into how the rankings are determined. Yeah, because it's quite a process. So yeah. what happens is that for each country in the top 50, our World Watch research team, and when I say our, I mean Open Doors International, mm -hmm examines the degree of pressure that Christians face in the five spheres categories of life. And those spheres are private life, family life, community life, national life, and church life. Yeah, so they, they look at those spheres and they ask questions like, um, is, is conversion to Christianity allowed? Will their family kick them out? How does their faith affect their education or their employment? Will the police come to their home? And are Christians allowed to gather together as a church? That, and they consider the number of violent incidents against Christians and the church. Yeah, so these six components, the five spheres of pressure, as well as violence, are each given a score out of 16 and two-thirds. And when you add up those six scores, you get a total number out of 100. And we call this the persecution score of a country. Exactly. Tonight, you'll hear us talking about the different levels of persecution. When we say a country has a high level of persecution, that means that its persecution score is between 41 and 60. Yes. And then when a country has a very high level of persecution, its score is between 61 and 80. And then when a country has an extreme level of persecution, it means the score is somewhere between 81 and 100. Yeah. So I hope that gives you some helpful context as we count down from number 50 on the 2024 World Watch List in just a moment. Now, tonight we'll be joined by a panel of analysts who will share some of the latest trends in global religious persecution. This will include Gary Stagg, Open Doors Canada's Executive Director, Andrew Croft, our Communications Manager, and Paul Estabrooks, our former Executive Director, who's worked with Open Doors for about 40 years. 
And as we hear from our panelists, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or in the comments. And we would love to answer your questions in uh, some upcoming videos on our YouTube channel. So be sure to subscribe and click the bell so that you're notified when we answer your question. Once again, we're so glad you've joined us this evening. Although the World Watch List might seem like a really sad list because it shows where our brothers and sisters in Christ are suffering for their faith, it also shows us 50 countries where God is working in the world, mm -hmm. where the hope of Christ is real and transforming lives. Yeah, like people all around the world, they're holding on to Christ even while it costs them. Yeah. Even in the darkest places, God's voice cannot be silenced. And so we pray for our persecuted family to hold on to that truth. Absolutely. With that, I invite you to join us as we count down the top 50 countries of the 2024 World Watch List. We will now begin with the presentation of the 2024 World Watch List, starting with number 50, Turkey. Although overall attitudes towards the church in Turkey have not changed, a reduction in violence has led to their ranking dropping from number 41. Number 49 is Malaysia where converts from Islam experience the most pressure and hostility, as every ethnic melee is expected to be Muslim. Number 48 is Jordan, where unrecognized churches, particularly those that are actively evangelizing, can face harassment from public authorities. Number 47 is Kazakhstan, where Christians with a Muslim background bear the brunt of persecution, both at the hands of the state and from family, friends, and community. Number 46 is Tajikistan. In Tajikistan, the government puts heavy pressure on all deviating groups, including the church, by tightening existing laws and by enforcing them strictly. Number 45 on the world watch list is Comoros. In Comoros, Christians face severe challenges in expressing and practicing their faith openly. Reports persist of local communities ostracizing individuals suspected of converting from Islam to Christianity. Number 44 is Brunei, where a small increase in violence against the tiny Christian minority has moved them up the list by two spots. Number 43 is Cameroon, where Christians face targeting by Boko Haram, separatist forces, and government security units. Also, abductions, killings, and various other forms of persecution persist. Number 42 is Indonesia, which received a small decrease in the violence score, which is helped by the fact that dozens of radical Islamic elements were arrested by the authorities and planned attacks were successfully foiled. Number 41 is the Democratic Republic of the Congo. In the Eastern DRC, the Islamist group Allied Democratic Forces regularly attacks Christians and churches. Additionally, the region is home to over a hundred other armed groups, further complicating the lives of Christians. Number 40, Qatar, where converts both from an indigenous and migrant background experience the most difficulty in living out their faith. Number 39, Mozambique, where Islamic State affiliates have continued to attack Christian villages and carry out killings and abductions. Number 38, Egypt. Discrimination of Christians and other freedom of religion violations occur mostly at the community level, particularly in Upper Egypt, where even building a church can lead to violent reactions from Muslim mobs. Number 37, Mexico where territorial control by multiple criminal groups continues to be the main threat to the church in the country, since Christian activities are frequently viewed as being a danger to illegal operations. Number 36, Bhutan, where no churches have official recognition by the state, which means that Christians are technically worshiping illegally. Number 35, Vietnam, which drops 10 places after a decrease in pressure in all spheres, while not much has changed for Christians on the ground, it seems that authorities at the national level are not sure how to react to increased international scrutiny of their freedom of religion record. Number 34 is Colombia, which drops 12 places after a decrease in score. However, Christian communities are still deeply impacted by the active presence of criminal and guerrilla groups. Number 33, Tunisia where there were more church attacks and arrests than in the previous reporting period. 
Number 32, Ethiopia, which rises seven places after an increase in violence score, with 15 killings and 284 attacks on churches and public Christian properties recorded. Number 31 is Oman, which rises from the 47th place. This was caused by several incidents involving the community of converts from Islam to Christianity. Due to security concerns, no details can be given. Number 30, Nicaragua, which was number 50 on the world watch list just a year ago. It has moved up 20 spots. Nicaragua's score rose more than five points, which was one of the fastest among all world watch list countries. And now, after hearing the first portion of the 2024 world watch list, we will go to Andrew, Gary, and Paul to hear about some of the latest research on persecution. Thank you, Nicolette and Jared. I'm uh, with Paul and Gary, and uh, we're just going to talk through some of the key trends and things that have come up in this year's World Watch List. So thank you for joining me, gentlemen. Uh, our first question, you know, every year the World Watch List research, uh, it shows us the top 50 most dangerous countries to live in as a Christian, but they all, Open Doors also publishes a total number of Christians. And so can you tell us what this year's number is and, and the significance of that over the last few years? The uh, total number of Christians that are persecuted um, for their faith today is at 365 million. Mm -hmm. So that's up slightly from last year. And it just indicates to us that things, of course, aren't getting better. They're, they're actually getting worse. Yeah, so persecution continues to grow yeah. around the world. Absolutely. Yeah. And that, that's what we're seeing. I mean, do you remember what the number was when you started at Open Doors, Gary? Mm. I think it was something like 215. Yeah, I think that's about what it million. was when I started, right? Yeah, so, 215 million. So you think about that, that's a significant increase. <laughs> Putting me on the spot here. <laughs> yeah. But signi significant increase, it's right? Significant and increase. And so sure. we continue to see that increase as, as it moves up another 5 million this year. Yeah. Now, at Open Doors, when we talk about the world, watch this. We often talk about uh, countries that rise on the list or they fall on the list. So rise, they go closer to number one, they fall, they go closer to number 50, or they fall right off the list. Now, in the countries that we've already just revealed, uh, there was two countries, the, the two countries that had the biggest falls on the list uh, were of two points or more were Turkey and Colombia. What can you tell us about what is happening uh, in those countries? Why did their scores drop? Well, I think the main, the main reason for the small drop in both countries was a diminishing an amount of violence. Mm -hmm. Violence is that subcategory that is part of how each country's number is structured. Mm -hmm. And so in both countries, there was a slight decrease in violence. Yes. Possibly in Turkey, it may have had something to do with the earthquake that occurred. They had a yeah. terrible earthquake last year. And uh, it may have taken their attention off of, off of the issue of mm -hmm. religious groups. But uh, the, um, there, there was a relatively small drop, but at least it was a drop. Yeah. Well, that's always mm -hmm. encouraging. Yeah, some positive news, I guess, right? And, and you know, we're glad that those countries have fallen. But also in the, in the countries we've already revealed, there, we had some really large risers, ones that have had large increases in scores. Oman rose more than four points, which was largely due to an increase in violence, the, the opposite of what you're talking about. But the, the biggest riser in this section is uh, Nicaragua. Nicaragua last year entered the World Watch List for the first time, and this year it's up to 30. Can you guys tell us what's been happening in Nicaragua? Why is it Well, the main, the main thing about Nicaragua is the Ortega administration um, who sees the, 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 the church as a threat. Mm -hmm. And so any uh, church or any church leader that speaks out about the authoritarianism that's happening in the country uh, will become targeted. Um, there's, you know, with, um, with that kind of administration, there's um, the paranoia that mm -hmm. accompanies it usually, right? So uh, authoritarianism, paranoia, all of that comes together. And so... Churches that are outspoken about what's happening uh, will become targets. They're seen as a threat. And that's the main thing with, um, with Nicaragua and what caused it to, to rise because mm -hmm. more people are speaking out against it. 
Uh, okay. Yeah, it seems like they're following the Cuba example. Cuba is the highest level country on the World Watch list in Latin America. Right. And Nicaragua seems to be wanting to follow that same pattern as mm -hmm. Cuba with the authoritarianism and therefore a, a lack of interest in any kind of religious group, frankly, mm -hmm. that uh, would challenge their authority. So the authoritarian government in Nicaragua is making life more difficult for Christians there. And, and as you mentioned, it's happening in Cuba. We're seeing that kind of stuff happening more in uh, Latin America than perhaps in previous years. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, we would love for you to submit your questions in the chat so that we can answer them. Uh, and But now we'll head back to Nicolette and Jared. Thank you to Andrew, Gary, and Paul for sharing about some of the persecution trends in the first section of the World Watch List. It's been very insightful to hear. You know, we are so glad that you are taking the time to learn about these trends. We also want to make sure that our policymakers in Canada are aware of these trends as well. Yeah, so on March 19th, 2024, Open Doors is hosting a special presentation of the World Watch List for members of Parliament in order to encourage them in advocating for policies that support the freedom of religion and belief. And that would really make a difference for our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. So, friend, will you help us out by inviting your member of Parliament to this event? You can do that in a few easy steps by visiting opendoorscanada.org slash invite your MP. The form there makes it very simple to find their email address and send them a pre-written invitation to our special presentation. It takes you 30 seconds to fill out. Yeah, it's really simple. And you can click the link in the description of this video or in the chat. And just that simple form can help us share the World Watch List research with our Canadian policymakers. And another reminder, make sure that you download your copy of the World Watch List as well. You can use it to guide your prayer life. We believe doing that is so essential to supporting our brothers and sisters who face persecution. And with that, let's continue with the release of the 2024 World Watch List. Let's continue with the release of the 2024 World Watch List. Number 29 is Turkmenistan, where the authoritarian government constantly monitors religious groups and individuals, However, Christians from a Muslim background bear the brunt of rights violations. Number 28, Central African Republic. Most of the country is occupied by armed groups. Christian leaders who have publicly denounced the violence have been threatened and church buildings have been burned and ransacked. Number 27 is Niger. In a disturbing trend, there has been a surge in targeted attacks against Christian institutions, such as schools, healthcare facilities, and other properties. There were at least a hundred such attacks in the last reporting period. Number 26, Bangladesh, where the killing of eight tribal Christians in April of 2023 in the Chittagong Hill Tracks was a rare but not unprecedented flare-up of violence in the country. Number 25, Uzbekistan, where Christians belonging to non-registered churches have suffered from police raids, threats, arrests, and fines. Number 24 is Morocco, where Christians from a Muslim background are not recognized by the government, are closely monitored by the security services, and most often face hostility from extended family. Their growing number increasingly leads to more incidents. Number 23 is Mauritania, whose score remained the same even though it dropped three places on the list. We're at number 22, which is Cuba. Cuba continues to rise up the list as church leaders and Christian activists that have stood against government human rights abuses have quickly become targets of various forms of hostility. Number 21 is Laos. Laos has the largest score increase on the 2024 World Watch list, with an increase of more than 6 points and rising 10 places, up from number 31. Number 20 is Burkina Faso, where at least 31 Christians were killed and many churches destroyed by the activities of jihadist groups. Number 19 is China, where thousands of church buildings were affected. Crosses had to be removed, communist emblems and slogans put up, church venues were closed or destroyed. Number 18 is the Maldives, where conservative Islamic attitudes of the general population make conversion to Christianity extremely risky. Expatriate Christians are closely watched as well, making Christian fellowship very difficult. Number 17 is Myanmar. 
In this majority Buddhist country, even well-established churches belonging to historical Christian communities are being attacked. Number 16 is Iraq, which rises two places after an increase in violence towards Christians. In the north, there appears to be less tolerance than previously towards Christians with a Muslim background. Number 15 is Algeria, which rises four places after an increase of six points, largely due to violence against Christians, with churches being closed and homes and businesses of Christians being raided. Number 14 is Mali, where Islamic militants, traffickers, and organized crime syndicates operate with increasing impunity as the government's influence diminishes. We're now going to continue to our panelists to learn more about the current trends of persecution. As we continue to talk about some of the key trends from the 2024 World Watch List, one of, one of the things that really stood out this year was uh, that churches are under unprecedented amount of attacks. And two of the countries uh, where we're seeing this are, are Algeria and China. What can you tell us about that? Well, Algeria has been going on for some time. T uh, Ten years ago, my colleague Jim Cunningham and I were doing a Standing Strong seminar in Algeria, and there was already obvious pressure on churches. In fact, they governed, the uh, police kept coming to the church where we were doing the seminar and asking us uh, to leave. So we actually left a day earlier than we had actually planned. Mm. But that was 10 years ago. It's increased over the years. Then this past year has been exceptional. There were 46 churches in the Protestant umbrella group in Algeria. And today, only four of them remain open. Wow. From 46 down to four. That, that alone ex explains uh, pressure, mm -hmm. that ultimate squeeze of uh, government. And uh, the country also had a lot of leaders arrested. At least 18 leaders mm -hmm. were arrested uh, for their r religious activities that uh, were not under Islam. And so it's been a big pressure year for this country. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned there, you know, the four four remaining churches, and I've heard that um, it's quite likely that those four are slated to close mm. within the next year. Oh, wow! So it'll be basically decimated. Yeah, that's very yeah. difficult. Yeah. What, what about China? Well, in China, um, you know, well the overall numbers of uh, churches that have been attacked or closed. Uh, is up sevenfold from last year. Wow. So that, I mean, that's quite an increase, isn't it, you know? And that represents um, around 14,000 churches altogether. 10,000 of those are in China. Mm. And, um, you know, some of it is because churches that had closed during COVID, um, the government took the opportunity to not allow them to open. And so, you know, these um, house churches have, have operated for numbers of years. Paul, you would know yes, that. Yeah. Uh, numbers of years, and they've operated in kind of like a, um, a legal gray area, legal mm -hmm. gray zone, if we put it that way. And, uh, but now they're just increasingly being, you know, uh, forced to close by the government or forced to not open again yeah. by the government. And so they're using that as an opportunity. And, of course, with impunity, they can... Just do that, yeah. you know? And so we see that happening in China. Yeah, I think the term house church is kind of confusing to some people because the initial beginnings of the unregistered churches of China, which is what these are officially, uh, began as what we call the house church movement, literally meeting in homes mm -hmm. and small groups. But then they began to expand. In fact, even 40 years ago, I remember traveling in China with a... Uh, with a colleague who was an agriculturalist, and we were doing research with some of our friends from Hong Kong as our interpreters. And uh, we watched a house church, this is a house church, meet out in an open field. Yeah. There were more than a thousand people in that meeting. It was an wow. agricultural area where the Christians produced more than the non-Christians. And so the authorities locally just left them alone. And every morning they would have devotions together out in an open field mm -hmm. before they started their farming work. And it was really amazing to see. And these kind of house churches over the years expanded, even in the cities. There were some what we would almost call mega churches. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but now 
since COVID. Mm -hmm. okay? COVID was a key turning point. The government shut down many of these so-called house churches. They were really quite yeah. sizable. Uh, and now have said, no way you're going to open again. Like they've kept them closed. So now China is literally reverting to the small house church meetings. Yeah. That's what they have to do. Mm. The interesting thing was Francis Chan was last year in China. And he, he went to one of these house, house churches that was what we would call a mega church. And they said, we, we saw the model of America and we wanted to follow it. Why can't we have a mega church? And so they, they developed one. Well, then the government came and shut them down. Yeah. And uh, he said the irony is that a year later, uh, almost a year later, uh, they had grown larger in number than they were when they had the bigger church, but now all meeting in small house yeah, churches. Yeah. Yeah. So even as the government uh, presses down on the on the church, it doesn't mean that it, that doesn't stop what God is doing. That's right, you know, which is incredible. That's right, it is. It is yeah. Now China uh, is having influence beyond its own borders. Uh, particularly, we're seeing uh, China having influence in Sub-Saharan Africa. What can you tell me about that? Well, they, they, China has uh, their number one goal in their international operations is impacting Africa. That's been going on for decades also. They actually mm -hmm. built railways way back in the 1980s for countries in order to develop a relationship with them. And now they are, now they are trying to export their, their governmental mm. situation, which is a lot different than just economics and social policies. So they've actually established a school in Tanzania where they are have six countries of leaders they're coming to train. They're training them in their one party authoritarian style mm -hmm. government as well as economics and the things that come out of that kind of policy. So they are they are showing a lot of influence uh, in rising ways which impact the church, of course, in that part mm -hmm. of the world. Yeah. And the countries that he's talking about that have come into that training center, the leaders of those countries, those are countries that are on the world watch list. Yeah. That are seeing, you know, an increase of, uh, of violence against Christians and just, you know, making their way up the list. Right. And uh, China is, um, you know, it's the Silk Road development, I think, right? Where, you know, they're also investing in a lot of infrastructure throughout the, uh, the whole continent. And uh, so, you know, they're, they're being looked at as kind of a savior in a way, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're, they're doing so much in the area to develop infrastructure and so on. Yeah, so it's a it's a developing trend to keep our eye on and, and and see how that impacts the church, right? Because in a lot of these countries, the church is already affected, but if China's taking more power, I mean, that, that probably doesn't bode well for the church. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and so as we continue on talking about trends, another trend that uh, we've noted in the World Watch List this year is that. Uh, Christians are feeling less and less at home in the Middle East and North Africa. They are, and it's uh, it's uh, it's sad to see because this is the kind of the it was always the cradle of civilization, as we mm -hmm. called it, and especially Mesopotamia area and Iraq, mm -hmm. um, and uh, with the challenges of the past while with ISIS and others who drove Christians out of Iraq, many of them have wanted to come back home again and reestablish mm -hmm. their homes and their churches. And they just keep running into roadblocks on that. Um, even Turkey has had an impact. Turkey has this antagonism toward an, a small ethnic group in their country, at least called, uh, called the Kurds. In the Old Testament, they were the uh, Medes. Mm -hmm. You remember the law of the Medes and the Persians? Well, the Persians were Iranian, and the Medes are the Kurdish people, who today are still considered one of the largest ethnic groups that does not have a homeland of their own. Although there is a province in northeast Iraq called Kurdistan, mm -hmm. um, but it's not officially run by the Kurds, still part of Iraq. And all of the pressures. Um, of, of a 
let's say, an Islamic government is creating challenges for people in that area. And so you have a whole lot of, um, of, of, of Kurdish Christians that are under pressure, mm -hmm. uh, even, even from a neighbor like, like, like <laughs> Turkey is. And, uh, and also then the challenge of not being able to reestablish homes of uh, the Christians who've lived there for centuries. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's become a, still a very hotbed of challenge for our brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. And in Syria, you know, we have had, uh, uh, after the earthquake, uh, a lot of people have just left. So a lot of Christians have left, and it's uh, kind of left the church in a bit of a vulnerable situation as well. And then you have in Lebanon, where we've had refugees that have gone from Syria into Lebanon, and uh, many of them were extremists. Mm. And so they're causing a whole different problem in, in that area. Yeah. And so it is becoming a lot less uh, um, hospitable, I guess, to Christians yeah. in the whole area. Yeah, and Lebanon has traditionally been uh, a, a place of uh, relative safety for Christians in that area, but right. now it changed now. So Lebanon is on the... Uh, persecution watch uh, countries this year. For those of you who are unfamiliar with that term, there are other countries scoring a high level of persecution, but they don't show up in the top 50. Uh, and uh, this year, Lebanon is is one of those countries. And so, yeah, Christians are feeling less and less at home in a place that they have called home for uh, since the beginning of the church. Yeah. And that's, yeah. a, that's a sad thing to think about and a, a thing that we do need to be praying for. Uh, the last question I, I want to ask you before we head back to Nicolette and Jared, um, uh, the, the country scoring the highest increase uh, in score on the World Watch list this year was Laos. Uh, can you tell us more about what is happening in Christians in Laos? Why is the score rising? We've seen a rise in the score because of violence that has happened in the last year um, with Christians there. Uh, we know of a situation where, for instance, I'm thinking of one situation where four people, I believe it was four people that were killed, Christians killed for their faith. Mm. And that's kind of unheard of in, in that country, you know, mm. relatively peaceful, um, again, you know, relatively safe place for, for Christians. And uh, we're also now hearing of um, situations where whole families yeah. and groups of families, extended families of Christians, are being expelled from their villages. Yeah. And so that's the increase that we've seen yeah. in Laos because of the high scores in violence towards Christians. Yeah. So it's kind of propelled them. That attitude has also been building for, for decades, ever since the Vietnam War. Yeah. In fact, their government, like Vietnam, perceives Christianity as an American religion. Right. And their attitude is, they tried to come and conquer us militarily in the 1960s and 70s, but they failed. But now they're trying to use their religion to come mm. and take over our countries. And it's that kind of attitude that's created a real problem for those who would want to follow Jesus and, mm -hmm. and become true Christians. Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, biggest rise are difficult to hear increasing violence, but, you know, I have this quote. Uh, that I want to read, and it comes from one of the country experts from Laos, someone who would have uh, in, done some of the research, and, and they said this, in all my years working as a researcher, I have never seen a clearer connection of a growing church with growing opposition resulting in higher scores, mm -hmm. right? So uh, amidst all of this difficulty, they're saying it's because the church is growing. God is at work, mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. and so that is worth rejoicing, even as we remember and pray for those uh, facing such a, an increase. And, uh, and so thank you so much, gentlemen. We are now at the point of the list where we shift from countries of very high levels of persecution to countries of extreme levels of persecution. By way of reminder, a country with a very high level of persecution has a persecution score of 61 to 80 points, and a country with an extreme level of persecution has a persecution score of 81 to 100 points. And of course, you can read all about this in the World Watch List Prayer Guide, which you can download your own copy of 
at opendoorscanada.org forward slash world watch list. And you can share this information with your member of parliament by inviting them to our special presentation for parliamentarians. It's a very simple process to do. Just visit opendoorscanada.org slash invite your MP and fill out the quick form right there. So as we mentioned, we're going to be focusing on countries of extreme persecution. And spoiler alert, one of those countries is Yemen. Yeah, Yemen is coming up on the World Watch list, but we wanted to, before we get there, just pause for a moment and hear the story of Salah, a Yemeni Christian who started a house church network. It's extremely risky for Salah to share about his faith in this way. In fact, we've had to hide his face and his real name for his security. But his story is a powerful glimpse at what God is doing in the darkest places where persecution is at its most extreme. So without further ado, this is Salah's story. From the moment I decided to follow Jesus, I knew that I would face persecution. My name is found on the radicals wanted list. They have my picture. Sometimes they watch me going from place to place. Usually I'm bombarded by threats. But all this won't stop my ministry. The more I receive threats, the more I am eager to serve. My brother and I decided to start a home church in Yemen. Fear dwells among the Christians in Yemen. For there are people that come to church with no intent of pursuing the faith, but instead spying and collecting information on us. We are very careful about the meetings. We gather in closed spaces to prevent outsiders from hearing us. We had new believers in need of training and baptizing. So my brothers and I sat down to take a decision. They eventually decided that I should not accompany them because I was known. I posed a bigger risk to them. When they finished the training, they decided to move to another location for baptizing. So they took a bus and started on the journey. They were texting me for a while, but after that, I lost contact with them. And in truth, I was terrified. I sensed that something had happened to them. I remember that evening I received information that they had been captured and put in prison. I was sad. I was crying. I felt guilty because I had allowed them to go to that place. My family was scared for me. They told me to flee the country. A lot of thoughts ran through my head. Should I stay or leave? I decided to hide in my home. During this time, I encouraged the rest of the brothers in my church. I would go secretly to meet them and pray with them, then return home into hiding. I would always remind them that when we decided to follow Christ, we were aware that things like this would happen. During this time as well, I would receive messages, phone calls and prayers. This would encourage me and enable me to keep going. Your prayers are crucial to us because they lead to miracles. Yemen needs brave servants to go out in society and proclaim the message of God. I could stay safe. I could remain at home and face no persecution. But what good is my Christianity for them? What good is my faith if I don't go out and deliver the message of God to others.
We will now present the top 13 countries, all of which have an extreme level of persecution. Number 13, Saudi Arabia, which is one of the few countries in the world in which church buildings are still forbidden. Number 12, Syria, where Christians fleeing the war's multi-front violence and subsisting amidst the collapsed economy have been easy targets of violence and of Islamic pressure to retreat from public life. Number 11, India, where the number of Christians killed for their faith rose from 17 to 160, and attacks on Christian churches, schools, and other institutions rose from 67 to 2,228. Number 10 is Afghanistan, where the Taliban seem to be more interested in arresting and interrogating suspected Christians in order to identify networks rather than in carrying out summary executions. This could prove devastating for the very hidden Christian community. Number nine is Iran. The government sees Iranian Christians as an attempt by Western countries to undermine Islam and the Islamic regime of Iran. Even historical communities of Armenian and Assyrian Christians that are protected by the state are treated as second-class citizens. Number eight, Sudan, which has risen from the number 10 spot because of an increase in violence against Christians. Violent actors have taken advantage of the chaos of civil war to target Christians, seizing churches and Christian properties. Number seven, Pakistan, where the number of blasphemy cases has increased, as has the number of girls from a Christian or other minority religion background being abducted, abused, and forcefully converted to Islam. Number six is Nigeria, where 11 Christians on average are killed for their faith every day. Number five is Yemen. The church in Yemen is composed mostly of Yemeni Christians with a Muslim background and their children who need to live their faith in secret. They face violations of religious freedom from their family and the authorities. Number four is Eritrea, where pressure on Christians is at an extreme level in all spheres, but is strongest in the national and church spheres of life, reflecting the fact that it is the government carrying the main responsibility for the persecution of Christians. Number three, Libya, whose increase in score is largely from an increase in violence following a major incident in May 2023 in which several converts from Islam to Christianity as well as expatriate Christians were arrested. Number two, Somalia, where clan leaders, elders, and family members monitor the movements of any suspected Christian converts. Over the years, Islamic militants have increasingly focused on identifying and eliminating Christian leaders. And number one, North Korea. Despite a drop in violence score, North Korea maintains its spot at the top of the list with maximum pressure scores in all spheres. And these are all the countries of the 2024 World Watch List. Well, already in our discussions this evening, we've noted that there's been an increase in violence in some countries. There's been an increase on attacks on churches. And one of the countries uh, where we're seeing a lot of that happen is India. And so what can you tell us about the dramatic increase in violence in India? Yeah, well, you know what? Let me just read this for you. This is from um, the article, uh, the Trends article. And it'll just give you some of the stats because there's a lot of stats and I don't want to mix, I don't want to mess them all up. So uh, let me just read this for you. In 2022, the World Watch list counted 10 Indian Christians who have been killed for their faith. On the 2023 list, the number was 17. On the 2024 list, it is 160. Oh. Now that's an, that's, an, that's an incredible increase mm -hmm. in the numbers. So it's gone from 2022, 10 Indian Christians being killed to 2024 uh, list where we now have 160. Increases were detected in other categories that help compromise the violence score. The number of attacks on Christian churches, schools, and other institutions reported in the 2022 list was 47, on the 2023 list, 67, and on the 2024 list, 2,228. So an, an another huge jump. Christian homes attacked, uh, 91 on the 22, 2022 list, 180 on the 2023 list, and nearly 5,900 on the 2024 list. Christian businesses attacked, uh, 2, then 37, and then 
1,572. Wow. Most dramatically, more than 62,000 Indian Christians were forced to leave their homes during the World Watch List 2024 reporting period. That was an exceptional jump from 380 in 2022 list wow. and 834 on the 2023 list. So it's gone basically again from 380 to 834 to now 62,000. Wow. I mean, those are staggering numbers. They when are. You think about it, you know, incredible. And I think, uh, you know, there's the epicenter of the surge of violence and displacement that we've seen in the state of Manipur. And Paul, you might want to talk about that. Yes, yeah, up in the northeast of India, that's one of the places where the, the most extreme violence occurred in this past year. Mm -hmm. And again, it's a, a tribal issue. Uh, we, we've often seen tribalism in Africa. For example, think of Rwanda in the middle 90s. Uh, two tribes that just about tried to obliterate each other. Uh, in this case, you have a tribe that is heavily Christian and another tribe that, that is Hindu. Mm -hmm. And so you have religious challenges there, and it's created a violent situation. Um, this is not, though, uncommon for the northeast of India in the tribal areas. The interesting thing I found when I visited there was that the, um, the people there... Uh, generally speak English to foreigners because they're all they have their tribal languages and so mm -hmm. the other language in which they communicate is English. We did a standing strong seminar up there some years back and it was in English. No translator. I thought that was one of the most unusual mm -hmm. things of of being uh, overseas in another uh, area. And there was a brother there who was a pastor sat right in the front seat. And we were talking about forgiveness. And uh, I said, Jesus said that we're even to love our enemies. We were talking about the expansion of love from your neighbor to your family, your neighbor to your fellow believers to your enemy. And he's sitting right in front and he goes, I can't do that. Uh, you know, as a teacher, you go, oh, okay, here's, a, here's a, somebody who just... so." Uh, I, I said to him, well, why, brother? And he said, he said to me, point blank, have you ever had your enemy kill your wife and children? <sighs> and I go, no, brother, I, I have never had to experience that, and I feel for you. He says, well, if you did, I think you would find it hard to love your enemy also. Well... I, I didn't, I think it was the spirits leading at that point. I asked the group, does anybody else in this room have similar experiences? And they all came forward to the front and began sharing about the problems. And we left that session with this pastor on his knees praying and these other people praying around him, asking mm. them, God, to help him to forgive his enemies. But this, so... For me, I, I sense that this tribalism, this challenge in tribalism is strong in that northeast area of India. And Manipur is where it really broke out and really uh, escalated mm -hmm. the uh, violence numbers last year. Mm -hmm. Staggering numbers, but it's not all bad news coming out of India. Some good news. Yes, well, politically there is good news. I mean, they, the, the political challenge has been the BJP party under Mr. Moody, who have tried to create Hindu nationalism through mm -hmm. the country. And it's, they, they are very, almost unapologetically doing that mm -hmm. and ignoring the minority groups, including Christians. Well, in Karnataka state, they had elections and the, um, the old Congress party that was in Dira Gandhi way back when um, was uh, noted for being the leader of the Congress party, which is a more um, open-minded, if you will, um, politically party. They, they uh, took control and they are now, they are now uh, indicating that they are going to back off of this strong Hinduism mm. and, and also anti-conversion laws. That's one of the things that India has been noted for. Mm -hmm. uh, 
was the anti-conversion laws. And so that's a, that's a real positive thing for Christians in that area. Now this year, in 2024, there are going to be elections, yes. national elections in India. And so the, the hope is and the prayer is that, that perhaps this, this attitude, it doesn't matter which political party is in there, but, but for the benefit of our brothers and sisters, uh, a Congress party win would be, would be a much, much mm -hmm. better situation for them. Yeah, and, and as the election draws near, uh, if you're following along with Open Doors, you'll hear us calling you to pray uh, because uh, there are tens of millions of our brothers and sisters in India who will yeah. be impacted by the outcome of that election. And so yeah. we will definitely want to be praying for that. Now, uh, as we're in the top 10, uh, one of the countries that's been in the top 10 we've talked about a lot recently is Nigeria. Uh, it's, and Open Doors has actually been placing a, a special focus, Gary, on on Sub-Saharan Africa and Nigeria with our Arise Africa campaign, because we've noted such an increase in violence. Um, has this trend continued in 2024? What can you tell us about violence in Sub-Saharan Africa? Uh, well, you know, yes, it has continued, and uh, it is concerning for us, obviously. The interesting thing, when it comes to uh, violence in killing of Christians, mm. The, the numbers actually come down a little bit by 600. Yeah. And the reason for that is because of, uh, in the spring there were elections in Nigeria, and around that time, uh, the government brought in extra security forces mm. to, um, you know, just to, to protect people and so on. And um, so the, during that period, the numbers went down. And so that's what, yeah accounts for the, the, the slight decrease. Yeah. But as soon as the elections were over, of course, it went right mm -hmm. back. I mean, it, it kind of tells you in a way that something can be done. Well, yeah, that's <laughs> you know? exactly what I was thinking as yeah. you were saying that. Yeah, and so, um, you know, it, to me, that gives me hope mm -hmm. that I think that the more pressure that is put on governments like the Nigerian government to do something to protect Christians I think, you know, it, it shows us that it can be done, right, you know? Absolutely. But yet, uh, you know, across the whole region, we call the Sahel region, which is um, Mali, Burkina Faso, and uh, Niger, uh, primarily in those areas, we see the destabilization of the countries mm -hmm. is like a vacuum for jihadists. Mm -hmm. And so they automatically, you know, plant themselves in, in those areas where the country has been destabilized politically mm -hmm. and so on. And um, so with that, we're seeing the rise in um, violence against Christians because they're the targets. Yeah. Now, as you were saying, like, you know, it kind of shows that something can be done. Uh, makes me think about this. We are going to parliament in March. Absolutely. We are going to be talking about what is happening in Africa to our parliamentarians, and so I would encourage you uh, to invite your MP to be there because we do believe that if we put pressure that it could have a positive impact on our brothers and sisters in Nigeria. Absolutely. Right, and if, if one country sees improvement from that, then maybe other countries will learn from that example, and, and so to please uh, do that. Uh, before we finish our, our, our event today, I, I would be remiss to not give you an opportunity to talk about the number one country on the world watch list, North mm -hmm. Korea. North Korea. Paul, you've been to North Korea. <laughs> yes. And so Yes, in 2010 I I took a, a prayer a prayer walk group uh, to North Korea. Uh, I had already written the book called Escape from North Korea, but obviously they didn't catch that when they were checking me out with the visa application or uh, the uh, uh, tourist yeah. visa. And uh, the, the thing that, it, that Im impressed me was that the capital city is like their showcase and they do everything they can to make it, everything look wonderful. When you take the train from the capital back up into China, uh, it, is, it is really incredible to see what life is like in the countryside. I mean, it's absolute abject poverty on the, on, 
I don't know why they would let tourists, frankly, do that, because it's just so obvious, uh, the discrepancy between the two areas in the country. But this year, uh, China has been developing stronger relations with North Korea. They even had uh, Kim Jong-un take his little special bulletproof train yes. up into China to visit uh, with uh, the, the leaders. And uh, China has been cooperating with them in the sense of returning the, uh, those who have escaped, those who are illegally in China, from North Korea. And reportedly, there are now very few Christians trying to escape the country, mm -hmm. as they had been for a couple of decades, uh, because they're really cracking down on, on, on that. So their relationship with China has, has built a rapport that's solidifying their hold and their control of people, which, as Gary mentioned earlier, authoritarian governments uh, must control everything, including, mm -hmm. uh, you know, even in their opinion, any religious activities in the yeah. country. Mm -hmm. And so it's, uh, it's been strong. They've also developed a, a further relationship with Russia this past year. So they, they seem to have the support they need in order to maintain that, that hard, rigid mm -hmm. control over, over our family that have lived there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And life is incredibly difficult for Christians in North Korea. Yeah, absolutely. As you may or may not know, it's illegal to be Christian, illegal to own a Bible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been number one on the list every year except for one since 2002. And yeah. so uh, we continue to lift up our brothers and sisters in North Korea. We did actually want to take a few moments and show you this short video, which will uh, tell you a story and, and show you how difficult it is to be a Christian in North Korea. 기날 제가 학교에서 집으로 돌아와 보니 보위부 사람들이 우리 집에 와 있었습니다. 기들은 우리 집을 엉망진창으로 만들어 놨습니다. 기 사람들은 두 가지를 찾고 있었습니다. 라디오입니다. 그리고 하바지의 비밀책. 저는 기책이 어떤 책인지 알지 못했지만은 그것이 위험하다는 것을 알았습니다. 보이부가 그것을 발견했을 때 다신 아버지를 볼수 없을 거라는 걸 알았지요. 기뻐하고 즐거워하라. 하늘에서 너희의 상이 큼이라. 너희 전에 있던 선지자들을 이같이 핍박하였느니라. 그가 말하길 소금이 맛을 잃으면 무슨 소용이 있을까? 사람들은 소금과 같습니다. 만일 우리가 우리의 친절함을 잃는다면 우리는 우리의 어, 영원함을 잃게 되는 거지. 지호야 항상 짠맛을 유지해야 한다. 알겠지? 아버지가 잡혀가신 후 저는 한동안 아버지가 가르쳐 주셨던 깃들을 되새겼습니다. 보이부 사람들이 라지오를 발견했다면 아버지가 잡혀가시는 게 당연했겠지만은 책 하나 때문에 잡혀가셨다는 것이 이해가 되지가 않았습니다. 기 책이 도대체 어떤 책이었길래 시간이 지나면서 아버지가 잡혀가시는 것에 대한 슬픔은 점점 희미해져 갔습니다 지금 당장 걱정해야 하는 깃들이 내를 더 힘들게 했기 때문입니다 먹을 것이 없는 고통 같은 것이지요 저는 
아버지가 라디오를 통해 북조선 바깥에 있는 식량에 대한 뉴스를 들으시던 것을 기억해냈습니다. 하나님의 은사는 그리스도 예수 우리 주 안에 있는 영생입니다. 그래서 저도 위험을 무릅쓰고 아버지의 라디오를 들었습니다. 보통 저는 제가 들어본 적이 없는 나라들의 일기에 보나 소식들만 들을 수 있었습니다. 가끔 우리나라의 식량 부족에 대한 상황을 듣곤 했습니다. 하지만 어디서 음식을 구할 수 있는지에 대한 정보는 어디에도 없었습니다. 그런데 어느 날 이전에 듣던 것과는 다른 것이 들렸습니다. 너희는 세상의 소금이니 소금이 만일 그 맛을 잃으면 무엇으로 짜게 하리요? 기날은 제가 처음으로 아버지의 하느님이신 예수님에 대해 들은 날입니다. 너희는 세상의 빛이라 산 위에 있는 동네가 숨기우지 못할 것이요. 그때부터 저는 기회가 있을 때마다 라디오를 들었습니다. 이렇게 듣다 보니 믿어지기 시작했습니다. 라디오에서 들은 예수님이란 분의 말씀이 내게 소중해졌습니다. 가는 곳마다 기설이가 들립니다. 여기 북조선에서 예수님을 믿는 사람은 내 혼자일지도 모릅니다. 그리고 앞으로 어떤 일이 일어나게 될지도 모르겠습니다. 여기 많은 사람들 같이 굶어 죽을 수도 있고 그렇지 아니면 아바지처럼 잡혀가게 될지도 모릅니다. 하지만 저는 소망이 있습니다. 저는 이 라디오 방송들이 어디서 오는지 이거이 제가 어떻게 듣고 있는 건지도 모릅니다. 하지만 이 라디오를 보내고 있는 분들이 얼마나 많이 내 인생을 변화시켰는지 알기를 바랍니다. 이 라디오 때문에 나는 예수님을 압니다. 저와 같은 사람이 더 있습니까? 라디오를 통해 예수님을 알게 된 사람들이 더 있을까요? 기러길 바랍니다. 북조선의 상황은 매우 어렵지만 은 하나님은 많은 희망을 주십니다. 비록 예수님을 따르는 것이 매우 위험할지라도 그것은 위험을 감수할 가치가 있습니다. 저는 다른 사람들도 이 위험을 감수하고 있기를 바랍니다. 기뻐하고 즐거워하라. 하늘에서 너희의 상이 큼이라. 너희 전에 있던 선지자들을 이같이 핍박하였느니라. 너희는 세상의 소금이니 소금이 만일 그 맛을 잃으면 무엇으로 짜게 하리요? 후에는 아무 쓸데없어 제가 아는 것은 제가 예수님을 사랑한다는 것 뿐입니다. 그리고 나는 소금의 역할을 끝까지 잘 감당해내 계십니다. 아버지가 내게 말씀하신 대로 What an incredible story that is from North Korea. I watched something like that and I'm so blown away and encouraged to know that despite persecution, even in the darkest places on earth, God's voice cannot be silenced. Yeah, he's moving and active and his church is growing and thriving. Amen. And uh, we want to thank you so much for joining us for this event. And again, if you have any questions, we would love to answer them in an upcoming YouTube video. So make sure you subscribe and stay notified for that. We also appreciate all of you that have already invited your Member of Parliament to our event in March. If you haven't already done so, you can invite your MP at opendoorscanada.org slash invite your MP. Now, we just heard a lot of information and a lot of it can be hard to hear. It can be really uncomfortable to learn about how much the church around the world is suffering for their faith. But we don't want to just hold on to that. We want to take it to God in prayer. Yeah. 
We do believe in the power of prayer here at Open Doors, and we ask that you pray with us. The number one thing that our persecuted brothers and sisters ask for is prayer. We have a quote here from uh, John, not his real name, but an Open Doors partner about the impact that your prayers have. He says, quote, What affects every believer in Yemen is the lack of community. We tell people they are being prayed for and show them prayers from Open Doors supporters so people know, whoa, there are people in the West praying for me, so I'm not alone. Yeah, your, your prayers are truly making a difference in the lives of our persecuted family. And so with that, let's head over to Andrew, Gary, and Paul and lift the persecuted church up in prayer. And so we're going to close our event with a moment of prayer. And so I do encourage you to pray along with us and, uh, and call out on behalf of our brothers and sisters around the world. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, it is heart-wrenching to go through these statistics that we have been looking at on the World Watch list. And yet we realize these statistics are real people. And they are people created in your image and the people we're talking about are part of your forever family. And yet, Lord, we, we our hearts go out to, to the, those who are suffering so significantly with the increase in violence around the world. And we pray for those who have lost family members who will be dealing with their grief and with the loss of support in many cases. And we lift up uh, these brothers and sisters to you, um, asking you, Lord, to indeed let them know how much they are loved by you and how you are able, more than able, to satisfy their every need and provide for their every need. We thank you for the glimmers of hope for certain areas of our world where they've changed their attitudes toward uh, your family, and we thank you for that. Uh, and yet, Lord, we, we are so aware of how many are living under continued distress and either pressures of discrimination or outright persecution. And so, Father, we are concerned today, as we know you are, when you, when you spoke to Moses from that burning bush about your people, you said, I am... I have seen their misery, I've heard their cry. Mm -hmm. I am concerned about their suffering, and so I have come down to rescue them. And I'm sending you, Moses. Well, we, we are not named Moses, but Lord, you've, um, you've helped us to see and hear and feel the, the cry and the needs of your people. And so we pray you would help us to be faithful in sharing our, uh, with, with others and to continue to bring to you uh, the needs of our brothers and sisters around the world, in Jesus' name. And Father, we, um, we think of this list and we often look at it as such a sad list and indeed it is when we think of what it represents and the persecution of our brothers and sisters. But Lord, we also are, we are quick to remember as well today that um, it is an indication of how you are working in our world because just as we've learned through all of this is that in some of these places where persecution is the greatest uh, and the opposition is the greatest is because you're working in such tremendous ways there, Lord. And I know that um, the guiding principle in putting all of these statistics together this year was the verse from Matthew 16 where it says, um, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And Lord, we're thankful today because even amidst the persecution, despite the persecution, you are building your church, and we know that you will continue to do so. So we, re we rejoice in what you're doing around the world, and uh, we are quick to, to point to those glimmers of hope that we see, but overall we know, Lord, that you are at work Mm, and that yes, you are Jesus. building your church. And so we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. And Father, we thank you that we've had the opportunity today to 
uh, to share information, to talk, to share stats. God, we're so glad that we can learn about this, Father God. But, but God, it's not about stats and it's not about uh, research. God, it's about the people of God that this research and these stats represent. It's about your children, our brothers and sisters. And so, God, today we lift them up to you. God, we think of the believer today who feels alone and isolated. God, we pray that they would know that we have not forgotten them, that we stand with them in prayer today. I think of the believer in prison, Father God, who, who maybe feels like the government has cut them off from the body of Christ. But God, we visit with them today through our prayers. God, they have not been cut off. God, I think of those who are running for their lives, who have had to flee their own homes and villages because of the violence against them. God, we pray that they would know that you are their home, that you are their rock, Father God, and that that we will help them in any way we can. God, that they will not be forgotten, but God, that we will stand with them. Jesus, we... Uh, lift up to you our brothers and sisters today across the globe who share our faith, but, but don't share our freedom. God, be with them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us today uh, for the World Watch List release event. Uh, we pray that you would were encouraged, that you were informed, and we ask that you would continue to pray for our brothers and sisters. God bless you, and have a good night.